All right, we're back, you guys. If you have not watched part one, please go back and watch part one. Why am I doing this? Because I felt there was a need. I put myself into Tamla's shoes as I've been reviewing multiple videos, reading different um, articles about this case. And Tamla's the age I am. So I put myself in her shoes. She's African-American, I'm African-American. I put myself in her shoes because that could have been me. But I'm a little bit different. I don't hang out with crowds like that. I just don't. I primarily grew up in an African-American neighborhood at a young age. When I became a teen, I was in predominantly white neighborhoods. So I get being the only one in the crowd. Not everybody's the same. I'm not saying that. I'm not against any race. I am a minority, so I do have to take caution with who I hang around with, who I associate with. But I just want to get my real, honest account of the facts from what I've discovered. I don't get it all right all the time, but I'm gonna give it from my viewpoint. Please let me know in the comments what you think about this case. What would you have done if you were in her shoes? Would you have gone to the party? Would you have stayed at the party? Would you have spent the night at the party? This video is my opinion, my opinion only. I am not accusing anyone of anything, but I will give my opinion, my commentary, and we'll go from there. ruled that Tomla Horsford's death was an accident, but the family attorney says he thinks the investigation was compromised. 11 Alive's Elwin Lopez has that story. Still many questions surrounding 40-year-old Tamla Horsford's death. Now the family might be getting some answers nearly a year and a half later. The mom of five was found dead in the backyard of a home in Forsyth County following an overnight party on November 4th, 2018. We had people over last night and we were drinking. Most of us went to bed. One of them stayed on the balcony. She was drinking and we just went out outside and she's laying face down in the backyard. The medical examiner ruled her cause of death as accidental as a result of her falling off a balcony. Now the GBI is reopening the case. The Forsyth County Sheriff's Office requested the GBI take another look. The mother of five's family attorney, Ralph Fernandez, wrote a letter to Horsford's husband with serious accusations on how the investigation was initially handled by the county. Fernandez claims witnesses gave conflicting statements. No one saw Horsford fall off the balcony and no photos were taken during the autopsy. He also believes someone interfered with evidence before law enforcement arrived on scene. So as we know, Forsyth County ruled that this was an accident, as well as the Georgia Bureau of Investigations also said that they ruled this as an accident due to multiple blunt force injuries. So let's get into the details of this. So here's the document uh, during the investigation of who was all at the party. Um, they were all Jean's friends or acquaintances, whatever you want to call them. There were two men there. They also mentioned Michael Pellerino. Um, what I found out from his video is that he is Jennifer Morell's spouse. So let's go into detail about who's who. So we have Jean, who was the homeowner. Jose, who was her boyfriend. Uh, Jennifer um, is one of her friends. Thomas Smith is a friend, and he's married to... Stacy Smith. There's also Paula who was there, uh, Sarah, Marcy, Nicole, Bridget, and Madeline. Madeline is the aunt of Jean. So we all know the party was on November 3rd of 2018. Uh, the death of Tamla was the next day on November 4th of 2018. So let's start with Jean. Jean recalls that Tamla was the life of the party. She was having a good time. She was drinking a lot, but didn't seem to be stumbling, falling over anybody. Jose said the same thing. He was down in the basement with the guy or um, with Tom. Uh, they were just watching the game, not bothering the women until it was time to sing happy birthday. Jean also mentioned that the person who was more visibly uh, intoxicated was Jennifer. Uh, so Jennifer had to be helped to the room to go to bed. So she probably was one of the first to go to bed along with Madeline as well. Um, but she did note that that was the only person that was highly intoxicated. 
So I was trying to follow through all of the interviews. There were kind of a mix of interviews. They were the initial interviews, which were a week to almost two weeks later for each person that was at that home that night. There was also um, the GBI or Georgia Bureau of Investigations interviews, too. So they're kind of intermixed. There was a lot of inconsistencies between both of the interviews. My thing is there was so much background noise. It didn't seem formal for most of the interviews. There was a lot of just interception, you know, with noise in the background. It sounded like some people were in offices where a lot of other people were. So there was not a lot of privacy, which I don't understand. So that was one of the problems that I noticed. I also noticed that the lead investigator, I can't remember his name, was it Christian? It was something, but he's since been fired because he was sharing information with his girlfriend or girlfriends, allegedly. Um, so he was fired from the, um, from the county, and which is another thing in itself, um, sharing information, making racial comments, a whole bunch of different things. I can't go into detail because there was so much information. I was trying to pack it into uh, the second uh, video, but um, my thing is the whole investigation was just a mess. There was no consistencies throughout anybody's story. They didn't confiscate enough information. The phones all should have been confiscated. This should have been investigated as a homicide. So I am not in law enforcement, never have been, never will be. Um, I also am just looking at this as a lay person, um, giving my opinion on this video. Again, I'm not blaming any particular person, but they all know something. Something happened that night. They had plenty of time to discuss it, give details, because it was a telling part in each uh, investigation. Um, everybody was like, well, I may have heard this or that, or they were giving leading information. It just didn't add up. So again, phones should have been confiscated immediately and download it then. Why does it take a year and a half for somebody to ask for those videos, pictures, things like that? That's where the evidence is, in those videos and pictures. Something happened that night to Tamla. She didn't fall down the banister or the stairs on her own. Somebody probably hit her upside the head with that propane tank or pushed her something because her injuries are consistent with a traumatic fall. So here's a document where the crime scene investigator uh, sketched the image of where the body was found. Tamla's legs were facing towards the lower level uh, patio there. Um, her hands were placed in this description here. Others during the interview said their hands were at her sides and palms up. Not sure. Again, a lot of inconsistencies there. So from what I understand, the Forsyth County um, coroner's report as well as the one that was done by GBI was pretty consistent with her injuries. Let's take a moment here to take a look at the details here. So the autopsy report reads here that she had abrasions of the face, which we noted that she had them on her face, um, the forehead as well as the temporal area. There was also a subglial hemorrhage, which only could be seen by observing the brain um, or brain scan, CT, MRI, or once the coroner opens up the brain. Um, so that is bleeding on the brain, soft tissue hemorrhage of the right temporalis muscle. That is the facial muscle on the side, so right-sided. Um, subarachnoid hem hemorrhage, again, that's in the brain, bleeding on the brain, which is consistent with a fall. Um, subdural hemorrhage, again, same thing, brain-related. Fracture of the second cervical vertebrae. That is one of the things that stood out to me the most. So a fracture of the second cervical vertebrae, and don't quote me, I believe there is seven vertebrae, six or seven vertebrae in the cervical spine, um, but basically it's the second one. So that's higher up near the brainstem or near that area. Um, so it occurs with a traumatic injury, which can be consistent with a fall. So basically what happens is your neck hyperextends, goes back, and then goes forward. So that is is more pressure on that second cervical vertebrae, but people can live with this kind of um, injury. Another thing that stood out on the autopsy report is the laceration of the right ventricle of the heart. We all know that the heart is a muscle, it's a very strong muscle. So to lacerate the ventricle, wouldn't there be some external injuries, maybe some contusions or bruising of the chest? That's my thought. I'm not a cardiologist, I'm not a coroner, I don't have experience in that, but that is my thought. If something internal is um, um, disrupted, wouldn't you see something external? 
besides bleeding. Sometimes you may not see bruising, bleeding on the outside of the body. But for the ventricle, the right ventricle, its job is to pump oxygenated blood into the lungs. If you don't have that occurring, then you're going to have some residual symptoms. You may get some swelling um, or edema is what we call it. Also, you may be short of breath, chest tightness, things like that. And the last three are dislocation of the right wrist, laceration of the right wrist and right lower leg, abrasion of the left arm, left hand, and left leg. So in my opinion, um, the dislocation of the right wrist is more consistent with falling down those stairs that were in the back of the home. Um, the lacerations and abrasions certainly could be related to a fall, but um, it's scraping of the skin um, and breaking open of the skin as a laceration. So honestly, I think somebody drug her body and placed it in the position that it was in. So here's the toxicology report. We know that she had alprazolam, or better known as Xanax, in her system, THC, which is the marijuana, and then she also had um, alcohol, which was three times the legal limit. It was also stated that she consumed a lot of alcohol, mainly the tequila that she had brought as a gift. Um, all of the things in her system are definitely mentally and physically altering, can certainly um, intoxicate and habilitate people, make them uh, confused or hallucinate, all of those different things. Not sure exactly because nobody knew exactly how she acted. All they said was that she was... Um, friendly and not seeming to be drunk or under the influence of anything in particular. So here's the autopsy report. It concluded that she had multiple blunt force injuries. Also, the alcohol intoxication is probably one of those different things that they did not put on there, um, as well as the alprazolam or Xanax, which was at low levels. So um, her liver had not already metabolized that medication. So it was definitely still in her system. So what bothers me here is that the initial investigation was so informal, inappropriate, in my opinion. Um, phones should have been confiscated immediately. Everything downloaded. It should have been treated as a homicide rather than an accident. Um, the lead investigator was already telling the coroner basically what he thought. Her injuries were definitely not consistent with a trip and fall from the bottom level. We all know that. I really think she fell off of those steps. And uh, a lot of her injuries were right-sided, um, which is consistent with somebody probably hitting her, knocking her down those stairs, breaking her wrists, lacerating the heart, and all those other different things. Um, the abrasions and lacerations to her lower extremities are more consistent with somebody dragging her body. That's my opinion, my opinion only. There was also a lot of bias in this case from the beginning because the law enforcement knows uh, people who were at that party, as well as the coroner has a close relationship with some of the people there or even the law enforcement themselves. Um, so I feel like there was a lot of bias. Even when GBI came in, I still feel like they didn't do enough. You don't ask the tough questions at the very end or ask them to say, um, what else am I missing? What else do you want to tell me? A lot of them were blabbering off at the very end of the day with this second investigation because they had already rehashed the story to each other. There was no hope for this second investigation. That's where I really think the FBI needs to get involved immediately. So here are my final thoughts on this case. Um, and they're kind of all over the place because I was just writing a bunch of different things as I was going through the uh, interviews. Um, are any of their accounts of what happened that night credible? I don't believe so. There was more to the story. There were four people, three or four people that left um, around 1030 or a little bit after that. But the fact of the matter is the times aren't adding up. The cameras weren't working. Allegedly, the batteries were um, needed to be recharged or whatever the story may be. But the fact that the alarm system alerts the homeowner when each door is open or closed is very telling. What happened there? Why was that last timestamp notifying the homeowner that somebody opened that door and did not close it? Do people in that town sleep with their doors unlocked? I don't know. If I'm hosting a party, everybody in that home will be in bed or somewhere. I know where you are before I take my time to go to bed. End of the story there. So another thing I noticed was that um, during Madeline, I believe it was Madeline's interview, so she's John's aunt. Um, Madeline uh, was sitting there giving her account of what happened, and John walks in with gift cards to Dunkin' Donuts as if she was trying to bribe the cops and then say, oh, this may look bad. You're damn right this looks bad. It looks very bad. So why are you coming in here into a 
investigation. Why is it informal in your home? It doesn't add up, you guys. Something's not right. This was so inappropriate and so disgraceful. As I said before, there's a lot of lies on truth that have come out. Jose was moving stuff around because of his OCD. I don't care what your OCD is. Stop touching stuff. You know that. You work in law enforcement. Stop touching shit that you should not be moving around. Again, I said that body was moved. Somebody moved that body. I thought it was also interesting that Jose was snooping around in the system to find out what was going on with the case. He was fired from there. Very telling sign as well. He may know more than what he's sharing. The last ones who are awake were Tamla, Bridget, and Jose. Somebody knows the story. Somebody's going to crack, and they should soon. This is the back porch of the home. Was anything dusted here? Did they take pictures and inside, outside? I don't know. I don't have that information. But I really think that some prints should have been checked on that propane tank or anything that could have caused a traumatic injury. Jean's ex-husband, Matthew, was also interviewed, and he said he built this deck, so he wanted it to be um, safe for his children. And the way the stairs are located, it's kind of tucks under the building and not extending from outside of the building. So if Tamla fell down those stairs, she definitely could have injured herself or especially the neck um, and her uh, broken wrist also is more consistent with falling down those stairs and she would have landed on the cement below and then the lacerations somebody dragged her from there this is my theory you guys i really think that there is more to this story than we know in conclusion tamla did not deserve this she was the life of the party she was fun she was engaging she was having a good time they all were over the limit that they needed to be for drinking but they were inside the home and safe nobody was driving her family deserves answers. She has six children that are now living without her. This is horrible, you guys. I really hope the FBI reopens this case and brings whoever did this to justice.